Thank you for tuning in to this weekend news overview of the Shenanigans podcast. I'm going to attempt to separate the news section from the rest of the podcast per listener feedback because hearing the news is a whole standalone traumatic experience and it requires time to process and probably some post-podcast self-care. Plus, the segment was getting to be too long to have as a brief add-on, so we'll test it out this way and see how it goes, and if it works, it works, and if it doesn't, we'll just tack this back on to the regular podcast episodes. That said, before I go over this past week's news, there's a thing I would like to read to you, although you can also read it at my blog at merididay.com. Now, this is from the Palau National Code, Title 33 Public Employment, Division 1, National Public Service System Act. This is from Chapter 6 under Code of Ethics, and it is Section 604, Conflict of Interest. No employee may take, participate in taking, or use his or her government position to attempt to influence any official action where it is reasonably foreseeable that the action could have a material financial effect on that employee or on any financial interest of that employee that is different from the effect on the public generally. An employee who is unable to disqualify himself on any matter because he is the only person authorized by law to perform the official action will not be in violation of this subsection if he has complied with the disclosure requirements in section 605. And don't worry, we'll get into section 605 too. No employee may acquire financial interest in any business or other undertaking, which he has reason to believe may be directly affected by official actions to be taken by him. No employee may assist any person for compensation or act in a representative capacity before any national or state government agency in any matter that relates in any way to the governmental duties of the employee. No employee may use or attempt to use the employee's official position to secure or grant privileges, exemptions, advantages, contracts, or treatment for himself or others, including but not limited to the following. Seeking other employment or contracts for services for the employee by the use or attempted use of the employee's office or position. Soliciting, receiving, or accepting compensation or other consideration for the performance of the employee's official duties or responsibilities except as provided by law. Soliciting, receiving, or accepting any gift or other item of monetary value from any person seeking official action from, doing business with, or conducting activities regulated by the employee's agency or from any person whose interests may be substantially affected by the performance or non-performance of the employee's duties, provided that this subdivision shall not apply to wedding gifts, customary gifts, and gifts exchanged between individuals on birthdays, holidays, and other similar occasions, provided that the gifts exchanged are not substantially disproportionate in value. No employee may engage in any outside employment or other outside activity that is incompatible with the full and proper discharge of the employee's office or position. The Ethics Commission shall, for each government agency, designate those outside activities that are deemed to be incompatible with the duties of the employees of that agency. Now, I think this is kind of what I was looking for when there's that whole thing about the environmental assessment for the Wyndham Palau development. Now that was prepared by a woman who works for the Ministry of Natural Resources, Environment and Tourism, but I have yet to see what the Ethics Commission has to say about that situation or really anything else related to the Wyndham Palau development. So we'll see how that goes. Now, section 605 is about the disclosure of financial interests, which is apparently a lot easier to navigate around than one would imagine. I mean, well, I mean, it's either that or the Ethics Commission plays favorites or enforces when forced or just doesn't care. But I can't say any of those are certain. So the best I can conclude is that somehow 
the makers of said disclosures are possibly not fully disclosing their information, I guess. Anyway, six, uh, section 6.5, Disclosure of Financial Interests. For the purpose of this section, the term reporting period refers to the preceding calendar year with respect to annual filing statements filed by public officials and the preceding 12-month period with respect to assuming office and leaving office statements filed by public officials and statements filed by candidates. No later than February 1st of each year, within 30 days of assuming office and within 30 days of leaving office, all public officials shall file with the Commission financial disclosure statements for the reporting period, disclosing their financial interests. All candidates shall file the required statements no later than 60 days prior to the date of the election for state and national offices. Financial disclosure statements required by this section shall state for the reporting period the name and mailing address of each source and amount of income, including compensation and gifts from persons other than the public officials or candidate's spouse or children totaling $500 or more, received by or promised to the public official or candidate, provided that contributors and salary and benefits from the national or any state government need not be reported under this subsection. The mailing address of every business entity, incorporated, regulated, or licensed to conduct business in the Republic, and every business entity which plans to do business in the Republic or has done business in the Republic during the two years prior to the time the statement is required to be filed, in which the public official or candidate had a direct or indirect ownership interest having a fair market value of $500 or more, and the amount of that interest. Every business entity in which the public official or candidate was an officer, director, partner, trustee, employee, or held a position of management. The name of each creditor to whom the value of $1,000 or more was owed at any time during the reporting period and the original amount and amount outstanding, provided that debts arising out of retail installment transactions for the purchase of consumer goods need not be disclosed. The location and value of any real property in the Republic in which the public official or candidate held a direct or indirect ownership interest having a fair market value of $1,000 or more, and if the interest was transferred or obtained during the disclosure period, a statement of the amount and nature of the consideration received or paid in exchange for such interest, the name of the person furnishing or receiving the consideration. For annual, assuming office and leaving office statements, the names of all persons who made contributions totaling $100 or more to the public official during the preceding four years. Where a public official's or a candidate's financial interests for a reporting period are identical to those reported on the last disclosure statement filed under subsection C, the public official or candidate may file for that reporting period in lieu of the disclosure statement required by subsection C, a statement certifying that his or her financial interests have not changed since the filing of the last statement filed under subsection C. All such statements shall comply with subsection F of this section. By the way, we're on subsection D and that whole thing about what needs to go in the reporting period, that's subsection C. Where an amount is required to be reported, the person disclosing may indicate whether the amount is at least $1,000 but less than $10,000, at least $10,000 but less than $50,000, at least $50,000 but less than $100,000, or $100,000 or more. Subsection F is the public official or candidate shall verify under penalty of perjury that he has used all reasonable diligence in preparing the disclosure statement and that to the best of his knowledge the statement is true and correct. The Election Commission, upon receipt of the nomination paper of any person seeking state or national elective office, shall notify the Ethics Commission of the name of the candidate for state or national office and the date of which the person filed the nomination petition. The Election Commission, upon expiration of the time allowed for filing, shall release to the public a list of all candidates who have failed to file financial disclosure statements. Any statement filed pursuant to this section may be amended at any time. Amending an incorrect or incomplete statement may be considered as evidence of good faith.
So let's go ahead and do a quick recap of the news I did put out this week. Um, I reached out to Wyndham's corporate office and I received confirmation that while it is legit a Wyndham development, I went ahead and sent a follow-up inquiry using the questions, concerns, and feedback that I've received from you guys online. So I will be following up on that part of the story if or when I ever receive a response back from the corporate office. And then on August 14th, 2018, Senator Gugobai Inabo posted the following message with a copy of an official letter from Senate President Hocons Baules and the House Speaker Sabino Anastasio. And the message read, Senator Hocons Baules, President of the Senate and Delegate Sabino Anastasio, Speaker of the House of Delegates, threatened to cut the fiscal year 2019 budget to Palau Visitors Authority and or budget to our embassy in the Republic of China, Taiwan, if Ambassador Dilmei Olgarin continues to support the Republic of China, Taiwan. So here's that letter again. This letter is um, addressed to the Honorable Faustina K. Raúl Maruk, Minister of State, regarding comments made by Palau's ambassador to the Republic of China, Taiwan, and it's dated August 13, 2018. Dear Madam Minister, we wish to express our concern and disagreement with the public comments made by our ambassador to the Republic of China, Taiwan, Ambassador Dilmei Luisa Olgaril on July 23, 2018. Ambassador Olgaril significantly misrepresented the Republic's position regarding Chinese tourism and our relationship with Taiwan. Palau consistently strives to promote tourism around the globe and welcomes all visitors to our island nation. The ambassador's comments reflect her personal viewpoint and are not representative of the inclusive tourism policy that our country encourages. Ambassador Olgaril is responsible for helping to facilitate diplomatic relations between Palau and the Republic of China, Taiwan. She's not in a position to unilaterally decide policy matters or to determine whether certain tourists will be excluded. Palau has signed an agreement to promote all tourism, including from the People's Republic of China. Furthermore, Palau is committed to maintaining positive and productive international relationships. It was incorrect for the ambassador to suggest that we have a preference for countries with the same system of government, such as Taiwan. Madam Minister, we respectfully request that the Ministry of State adopt a uniform policy on tourism and apply that same policy to all countries with which Palau has a relationship. The tourism industry is extremely important to Palau and we wish to avoid any statements that might jeopardize our international relationships and economic stability. As Minister of State and the former Vice Chairperson of the Palau Visitors Authority, you are well versed in our country's approach to tourism and the policies by which we abide. We therefore request that you advise Ambassador Olgaril to act in accordance with the prescribed approach and policies on tourism. Her public comments should be representative of our country's stated principles and values related to the tourism industry. If these requests cannot be accommodated, Tolbil Ragalula will be forced to take action in the fiscal year 2019 budget. We will decrease either the budget of the PBA or that of the Republic of Palau Embassy in Taipei or both. We will not promote funding two entities with conflicting policies. As a nation, we must take a uniform stance. You have the requisite knowledge, understanding, and experience to facilitate and ensure such consistency. We therefore request that you direct your ambassador accordingly to promote a cohesive and economical tourism policy in Palau. Respectfully and sincerely, Sabino Anastasio, Speaker House of Delegates, 10th Olvil Ragalulao, and Hocons Paules, President of the Senate, 10th Olvil Ragalulao. CC in this letter are President Tommy E. Ramangasao Jr., Ms. Dilme Luisa Olgaril, Ambassador to ROC Taiwan. Mr. Mirai Velast Metuol, Chairman, Palau Visitors Authority, all delegates and all senators of the 10th OEK. And then after that fun debacle, I went over these interesting documents that I had stumbled across. So here's that segment for you all again.
since we're discussing development projects in Imalig, now, for those who are unfamiliar with the process, anyone doing business in Belao, who is not a Palauan citizen, has to go through the FIB or Foreign Investment Board. That said, let me tell you about this interesting set of documents I stumbled across. Now, this is three pages long, and page one is a letter dated October 4th, 2017. It is addressed to the Foreign Investment Board chairperson, who would be Ms. Susan Mirausui, and it is signed by Kuye Blelai. And of course, while this set of documents will be available for you to view on marire.com, let me go ahead and read this letter to you. Dear Chairperson Mirausui, my name is Kuye Blelai. I am staying in Koror, but I'm from Leui, Imalik State. I have several land property located in Leui Hamlet. My Chinese investor friend's name is Mr. Chang King Wen with passport number E57856997 issued by the Peoples in Republic of China. Mr. Wen is currently applying to build a resort hotel in Leui. His application is going to be filed soon with the name as Palau China Resort. We are currently negotiating for the long-term lease agreements with them for the construction of the resort on our land. We are presently negotiating with the state of Imalig for a possible rock site to build and operate a quarry. These letter of intent is being sent to you so that you can proceed to consider their respective application while awaiting the lease agreement which will be concluded as soon as possible. To this end, we are requesting that you consider their application and we will be contacting you shortly to provide the required lease agreement. Your cooperation on my request is fully appreciated. Sincerely, Kuyeb Lelai Adra Lehui. Now, it is worth noting that Kuyeb Lelai is the wife of House Speaker Sabino Anastasio. Page two of this document will explain why this matters is a summary of foreign investment approval certificate application. Wow, that was a mouthful. Name of applicant Palau China Resort Inc. PCRI hyphen high quality hotel. Application filing fee $2,500. Date first submitted 10-11-2017. FIAC application number 646-2017. FIAC application is new. Date of charter in Palau, September 26, 2017. Applicant stated scope of business to build, operate, and manage a high quality hotel in Imalik State, proposed term 50 years. Form of business enterprise Palau Corporation. Location of proposed project or business Imalik State. Amount of investment, $5 million initial capital investment. Amount of paid in capitalization if corporation, none at this time. Shareholder's name, nationality, or summary if more than one. Wen Chang King, 700 shares, 70%. Liu Ji Hui, 100 shares, 10%. Li Yun, 100 shares, 10%. Wen Hao Kun, 100 shares, 10%. Local Agent for Service of Process in Palau, Mr. Sabino Anastasio. Care of P.O. Box 9048, Koror Palau 96940, telephone number 680-7750393. Important notice, the entire application for an FIAC is important. Files may be reviewed at the FIB office in Meuse. The application is enclosed and should be reviewed in its entirety to be assured that all significant details are learned. The FIB provides this summary for convenience only, and it is not meant to be a substitute for a full review of the application or other parts of the file. Now, page three, the last page, is also dated for sometime last year. Um, it looks like September. I'd give you the exact date it was written. I mean, the date is right here in front of me. It's just... I'm not 100% certain what all the numbers are in here, aside from the, I, I think what says 09 and the 2017, but the actual date is kind of, looks like letters. But let me go ahead and read this to you too. Palau China Resort, Inc. PCRI change of local agent due to the local agent requirement 
Stated in the Foreign Investment Act RPPL 9-64, the local agent of Palau China Resort Incorporated, Ms. Linda Hui, has been changed to Mr. Sabino Anastasio, care of PO Box 9048, Cora Palau 96940, telephone number 7750393, signed by Yun Li. So I read to you from the conflict of interest section from the Palau National Code at the beginning of this episode, and you can read them again at radio.com. And I'll leave the news at that, at least until I get more information, because we've still got 20 more things to cover, but also because I'd really like to see if the Ethics Commission actually gets involved in any of these matters. Guests are arriving on time to the second. They always do. And you always act like it's a miracle. My dear Tattoo, when each guest is paying $50,000 for a three-day stay on Fantasy Island, he or she deserves miracles. Right, boss. Okay, so I realized that intro is just a whole lot funnier if you're like my age on up. It's the opening scene from an episode of Fantasy Island, and if you've never seen it or heard it, I assure you that was like a staple show of my childhood. You should look it up. Anyhow, this is about planes, well, airlines, which is why there was that whole intro. And it's about an article that came out in the August 2nd, 2018 edition of Tia Belao. And the headline says, Young Palauans own two airline companies. And since I was unable to actually find this article online, I'm just going to go ahead and read it to you. The chairman of the Sea Passion Group, which operates the Sea Passion Hotel in the Malan and the Palau Pacific Airways, Chu Hung Chow, in his address before the House of Delegates during its opening day on July 10th, caused a havoc in the Palau tourism industry when he declared that his hotel is not getting reservations and his airline will close in August partly due to Chinese government making advertising of tourism of Palau and China illegal as a pressure against Palau's diplomatic ties with Taiwan. Tourists from mainland China constitute about 50% of tourists to Palau annually. Now this led many in the country to question the ownership of Palau Pacific Airways, whose plane's name was changed last year to Sea Passion Group. And a check at the office of the Attorney General and the tax office shows that Palau Pacific Airways, a Palau corporation, is owned by three young Palauans. Uh, there's Juan Urera Langong Jr. as president with 35% of the shares, Marlin Lutfelti, vice president with 33% of the shares, and Colin Stagueo, secretary treasurer, with 32% of the shares. Langong is from Mermid and works at the airport, while Stagueo is from IRA and is employed by IRA State. Glut Felty could not be located nor identified. The corporation was registered and received its charter in 2014 and made only one annual corporation report in 2015, which covered 2014. Since then, there have been no annual reports for 2015, 16, and 17. The company has been flying its plane between Palau and Hong Kong and Macau weekly for three years and recently flew Palau's athletes to Yap and back for a fraction of the cost of United Airlines. 
One of the owners said they received some money for some time, but since 2017, they were told that the Chinese had decided to go with another group. He said the plane was parked at the airport for some time, and its name was changed to Sea Passion Group. He mentioned the name of the new airline and the names of its new owners. The name of the new airline company that has a business license is Belau Force Airline Corporation that was formed last year. Its owners are Jake Ramon, President, Huda Obak, Vice President, and Kimio Nakamura, Secretary Treasurer. Ramon is reported to be working at the Immigration Office while Obak and Nakamura are employed at the President's Office in Mewens. The three could not be contacted prior to this story going to press. Are the six young Palauans being used as fronts by the Chinese investor? Have laws of this country been violated? Did the airlines pay airport landing and other fees, as well as social security, employee, and business taxes? So after this article was published, there was a weekly press conference at the office of the president in Mewens, and there, Tiabelaos Gambes Quesole took the opportunity to ask the president face-to-face -face and on the record about the story. Needless to say, President Ramangasau was less than thrilled to be asked that question and made no bones about it. Quick note, the press conferences are held in Palawan, so for those of you who are not fluent in Palawan, I will provide notes at the end, just touching on kind of the major points that were brought up. Uh, Mr. President, a mm. uh, question on the other related to the other one. The other one is 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 the other one. The other Palau Pacific Airways was it to suspend the flight operations indefinitely. Ela hindi nga 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 ABSL Airline, el Belau Force Airline. Ela ah, ang blagatak rababira obis ra Attorney General lo wasi. Our owners are 100 percent owned by Palawan. Our owners are nga artero nga a staff for obis ra President. Ya imo ra owner alu sa kila. Uh, mal closely related to the first lady. Mm. I get away. Malum was it. Ah, guy, you the lossy will see the chairman as a passion group. Ah, a wall blood operator, operator on airline, low spare, a girl, bella, will tear up close silver of his row. And now while I seen Sara, a vessel airline. No one got a front turning. So I'm going to go to the actual girl. They are man sole campesa. I got to look at Iliwi, a Arigolo Gamura, Tabela Girel, Mang Takti only Tribul was a show air of Mosa that were our front, Mangarang, Kitty, Tigal Toil, Tigal Adam Clow Adel Adults, a Solate Alra business, a Morang Idil Adel. The Albulgula said Toro of his president, Mandal Sebil, Morina Sobartir. A white clock to Tlil Gariola, Sing Naral Prasses, Aluliaki, Naral La, Naral Tretala Luliaki, a good loss of ill, and establish a business at Tirma Airline. Then the Alcatir and Malgel Belau in Moan. If you look at the records, Arbek Ladel Mlamo, Osco Airline, Adim Lagalom Araskogi. Nindi ka adal bela ulse el maras kogi. Di tmo mentri ar adal sebil lo kordi a airline establish a FIB i kombali tir malubet establish a partnership tir malubet tmo maya license tir a a finance malubet tmo sel especially to ang ari sel process lo ay ka MPIIC emergo enter into partnership. Yeah, yeah. I'll soon bring any legitimate airline, ma a consistency, ma capability, ma funding. I'll say I'll make sure and I get service. I'll promise a other available lot of And then it's only issue a permit. By me, mo mesra process ma otir clear la eh. Emo lu sa arigo lo ng biwe la kadim dula sa tourer o bisa presidenta to front rak munta. Ma detigam maklola. 
kaum ngari alam el tem el bu el lain ma ngidi el adal ngarti ngari alam el tir <hesitation> kita mendengar kemudian ngari adal bela ulsi el mera ras kogi ngidi ngari a prases ma alam el tel ngidi el adal partner ra a adal seb el lot o kordi as kogi eta flail me meng ters ai beli beng ngari a kme del te a el adal <hesitation> eight license ra balu bela o a if i'm not mistaken One way or another, it took me longer to get all the skills. Me, abai important to show all duly campus as in sell the tile and lor a house a the walgor or ice lor as in most the most stable fly. Me, dim laga tal lor a inform a minister. Malu el kwam lani ababiel mera government lor as in. Ama ma mosto bel fly mel luko ang aring iya agukte ele del mega adjustment malubo ko to respond malubo ko to get still asay ng ram kom asto mung tumi hindi ka algire lang i dil major el kompali il do business el belaw especially in the tourism luko ra di kibet tiyak la announcement tertir el luwa ika kita you would think lo asay Al suku ma United, malu al suku ma Gidil Airline, China Airline, encounter a problem. At least the lolo usenbel wase kama magora al almost double fly malu bagi mo titwok. Mata adu lo mesa ngari apa bilang la minister akum dah selam la mora malu ben communication dengan ilmong lo maklat kertil wase ngar aliul. Lo ay sa ikal tao el mera ministry, hindi akong di ba? Kiyul mo ramada la house mar other bela ay mo ay sa ikal tao. Ang erung ng manamoto kasi bungul ko ra tao bdalwa sa bela ug le ko ra panic malubo bdalwa ra. Di swa kal asyur ko mera other kasi bungul na sa hindi akal katengel la bela ul airline na stop ul mo di akal fly me. Kadang mesa history lagi dengan yang kembali melat suburir, kembali raskogi mengdirect serial suburir kita guk melongar alih dalam sikro alih luas kadang kadang yang mau replace serial airline ni, mengkadang la encounter arwa atau rarak tel kel tel le sars serial boring sars yang di muda raskogi mem kita guk mau anex terletal luas kadang kadang yang guk mau aigel Baby Rablu, sebab itu lomdoi sera okya kalmel mobilan seperti itu. Meng Baby Rata meng kabel men tabai keluar ngul lekat mendengar luas lekat mui begi kami ulah nasi bunga omak tak ter other bela luas Ali Ali elah kat mudi akal store lora la flight tera Hong Kong almi. Meng I think yang require responsibility lagi tu lekat adal biologi rakle merangan. Akmurti ang akambes selekti why silo asya akabel mentra Taiwan adirect lado ng dadu urtiret etirgegi dal mo dabo la flight tra China Airlines from two flights a week dal mo four flights a week mung ay kaya extra tua already ng ding ng katala la mo help pergi Japan Airlines ma all Nippon Airlines ana mtirek na malgol mil mo increase sa charter flights etir Lengal sang sila ro kaya kada kal bulgulang sing Hong Kong ang merbela o ulang longsong sa ro kaya. Ang al sang sila ro kaya kamal sila stop at Delta Airlines, el sur para Tokyo ma direct ang merbela o yah Delta Airlines na ulit tagara fifty percent tara ro kaya kasi abal ang merbela o. Masira ka ba rule stop ang mo dyan albora kwam, mo dyan albmerbela o, mo dyan albora asaybal. Ang ukno ang ra lendro si kaskogi lo tagat tirge lo gim el masen talan tras abal el mi. Mungkin orang muda lawai semua sing adi mereka dal time, ya bela aku kosi sepi ya sing sky mark, sky mark. Mas sky mark abol fly direct flight tras ya bal bay, mesti tera guk mo guk mo pick up bersegi gitu. Di kosi sil time mac China airline. El fly ra Taipei, el mora Taiwan, amla a Taipei, Taipei el mora Shabal, amla a fly ra Shabal, el mo fly el mora Shabal, engar Shabal le direct el merbelau. Mung 
Kamlabi Fernanda ka Minister uh, Foreign Affairs sa Taiwan, makapalmenta siya ba? Tukuk mare Ersel uh, kang ertir. Lebela ko ng el uh, China Airlines and el flyer at Taipei el mera balur bela. Mung ay gaigi de ay el kukura efforts el ngarngil domes ma increase at charer as uh, siya barra anama at uh, chal el me. In fact, the campus is a mosaic of the time. The uh, 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 air, uh, air New Guinea, the flyer, the air, 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 the Luul and dia dia kata tu luar sikit ngiri dal panik. Lalu berapa lama el anga pigo seng imol airline el modal al flying ngara Hong Kong el main. Of course yang ada business el connecte dal mula iye dal tour agencies malu beng iye dal airline ada sini. Di sebab dal guk misteri al modal okia kal dia necessary tamla Hong Kong el main. Esai dia sel in line with our policy campus lo hace ali at a package tour and then along ir belau le package tour a clolu do do di perin ra kre belau arada di mel ordering blata clavas el ngarngi ma restaurant el bolo mungurngi ma hotel el bol kergi ma er tel bol ngas ngi el moral ba kida da de al so da i gei so da tirgel ad el mei ngaria choice til wuk mo hotel ra ad el belau ma luben wuk pe bira hotel yo mungurngi del ge restaurant e moi tau do do man le gei gida do tax la tax le e gal paket stura marina do la tax ra ad el di pera outside man Ngora maral morio a numbers and din de al sal mal afectra a blur belao len a maral ni di stati que gare ludo da dolar ni ra yegi del package. Nagabay malo maral wa se olugum kada maral momesa increase a Taiwan ma siabal ma Korea ma Europe ma Miguel e yegi da yegel se el mer okia que mbase kada blur kada madengir kung a ludo da mutra al se la blur belao mga Tapi kalau ada orang yang mau kertir, saya paling sil soal el masang. Kalau rumput, resilient, tapi ada belau lindak al katengi dan mau mau tiang. Kadem kadem lau yuk bagai kalau bek el bangalela blur belau, important tu asing poltar rumput ada adres ahi kal. Il mondo è il dalban. Ok. So, major points that were brought up. Gambes had asked the president flat out if the new airlines, Bilal Force Airlines, is a front as well as Palau Pacific Airlines. Um, he did cite how two of the owners of the new airline are members of the president's staff, as, while also pointing out that the third owner is a very close relative of the First Lady. Uh, the President's response amounted to calling the Abelao's article fake news, um, saying that the press should investigate better and stop causing panic, citing that these people are adults, and that everyone has a right to own an airline whether they work for him or not. He cited talks between Palau, Taiwan, and Japan with agreements for increased charter flights and cited Delta rather than Palau Pacific Airlines ceased flights as a major factor in the reduced number of tourists. Additionally, he made mention of a possible deal with Air New Guinea in the works and cited again that it is everyone's responsibility to look at the facts and recognize that anyone can own an airline. The most notable part of this question and answer session from the August 8, 2018 weekly press conference is that for the 11 plus minutes that the president spent answering Gambes Quesole, he never actually answered Gambes's question. So the same question that was at the end of the newspaper article, are these young Palauans being used as a front? Still a question. So that's our update on airline things. And again, if I get new information or anything else should happen, I will, of course, be updating and following. And finally, for our last story in this weekend news overview. 
I posted an article on marieday.com on August 10th titled Human Traffickers Get a Slap on the Wrist in Palau. This was originally published in the Marianas Variety. While Palau has shown significant improvements in its law enforcement efforts against human trafficking, convicted perpetrators receive lenient punishments, reflecting a failure to treat trafficking as a serious crime. This is according to the U.S. Department of State's 2018 Trafficking in Persons Report, or TIP report. Over the last five years, Palau has gained notoriety as a destination for women subjected to sex trafficking and for women and men subjected to forced labor. Women from the Philippines and China are recruited to work in Palau as waitresses or clerks, but some are subsequently forced into prostitution in karaoke bars and massage parlors, the report states. The TIP report said Palau still did not meet minimum standards for elimination of human trafficking due to deficiencies in several other key areas. The government did not provide or fund emergency protective services such as shelter, medical, or psychological care. There was also a lack of proactive victim identification and referral protocols. There were no guidelines for proactive identification or referral process to guide officials in transferring identified victims to care providers or protective custody, the report says. Palau's foreign population, about one-third of the country's population of 21,400, is the most vulnerable to trafficking. Filipino, Bangladeshi, Nepali, Chinese, and Korean men and women pay thousands of dollars in recruitment fees and willingly migrate to Palau for jobs in domestic service, agriculture, restaurants, or construction. Upon arrival, some are forced to work in conditions substantially different from what had been presented in contracts or recruitment offers, and some become trafficking victims. Now, I received a lot of feedback on this article, so I wanted to address some of those comments, questions, and concerns that were brought up. What does Tier 2 even mean? Well, there's three, more like three and a half, placement tiers that are based on a nation's compliance with standards outlined in the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, TVPA, of 2000. Tier 2 placement refers to countries whose governments do not fully comply with a TVA's minimum standards. However, they are making significant efforts to bring themselves into compliance with those standards. Now, we've been in Tier 2 since 2009. This is less than ideal because there are consequences for countries that drop into Tier 3. Pursuant to the TVPA, governments of countries on Tier 3 may be subjected to certain sanctions whereby the United States government may withhold or withdraw non-humanitarian, non-trade-related foreign assistance. In addition, countries on Tier 3 may not receive funding for government employees' participation in educational and cultural exchange programs. Consistent with the TVPA, governments subject to sanctions would also face U.S. opposition to assistance except for humanitarian, trade-related, and certain development-related assistance from international financial institutions such as the International Monetary Fund, IMF, and the World Bank. Now, per the U.S. State Department, no tier rank is permanent. Each and every country can do more, including the United States, but all countries must maintain and increase their efforts to combat trafficking. Another question that was brought up, has the government been notified of their tier two ranking? What are they doing about it? Short answer, yeah, the government knows. Uh, in reviewing the US State Department's Trafficking in Persons Report archives, Palau has been a tier two country since 2009. In fact, in 2012, an American television network doing a series about human trafficking in the Philippines mentioned Palau as one of the destinations of human trafficking victims from the Philippines. Uh, PBS, Public Broadcasting Service, did a series titled Agents of Change that featured the Visayan Foundation Forum, which told of how Filipinos, mostly women, are lured into working in the Pacific Island nation of Palau for the promising pay. The Cyan Foundation Forum is a non-government organization that fights human trafficking in the Philippines. The group had been conducting an undercover sting operation in an attempt to end human trafficking. In one particular sting, the alleged trafficker was to be given the equivalent of $1,500 up front, all in marked bills. Pictures were enclosed of young women applying supposedly for waitressing jobs in Palau. Here's an audio clip from that. Stories of abuse and unpaid wages are so widespread that the Philippine government has even considered barring its citizens from working as domestics in some countries. 
To prevent more women from falling prey, Visayan Forum works with the National Bureau of Investigation to conduct undercover stings that have been encouraged by the government of President Benigno Aquino, which has pledged to crack down on these illicit recruiters. On this sting, the alleged trafficker was to be given the equivalent of $1,500 in upfront fees, all in marked bills. Pictures were enclosed of young women applying supposedly for waitressing jobs in the touristy Pacific Island nation of Palau. We learned that some of those who eventually went there, instead of being waitresses, were turned into... They were forced to sit with the customers, have a drink with them, then sometimes forced to go out with them for sexual purposes. They were prostituted, in other words. In other words, they were prostituted. Are you excited? Are you nervous? Quite, because it's my first time to do this. <laughs> yeah, it's my first time. Michelle Ramos of the Cyan Forum social worker was one of the three women posing as job applicants. The two others were detectives. So we are expecting minimal resistance uh, in the target area. So Cecilia, the uh, police have asked you to just wait here. Yes. They're, they're doing what now? Yeah, we're doing actually to check it. Okay. Kind of they're the casing the area? Yeah. To make sure? Yeah, they're actually rounding the areas to check yeah, okay. if it's secure or not. 30 minutes later, there was word from the undercover decoys. As of now, I just received a text message that they are piling up the, you know, the form. And yes, that's, signing the yeah, forms. the forms already, and that uh, the next page is just to, to pay the money, and that's our cue. Another text followed. The suspect had accepted payment, actual proof that a crime had been committed. Oibanda and counselors followed on the heels of the law enforcement officers. <laughs> Detectives collected evidence and questioned the alleged trafficker. <laughs> Oibanda sat with a handful of stunned young women who had been held here expecting to soon leave for Palau. Yeah, so the, um, they are actually uh, arranging their, their things and they're going with us. The job of Visayan's counselors now is to reassure victims that help is available and that they in fact have been victimized. At headquarters, the alleged trafficker and a partner were booked. It quickly became clear from dossiers of dozens, perhaps hundreds of job applicants, that this was a big catch. Jordan. Hello. Again. Trafficking is a non-bailable offense that carries a life sentence. Whether it's a deterrent, though, is an open question in a justice system that experts say is plagued by corruption. Geronimo C. is a prosecutor in the Department of Justice. Who polices the policeman? Who prosecutes the prosecutor? Who judges the judge? Who polices uh, a corrupt media? You know, when, when everyone is in cahoots, especially if these are well-entrenched uh, interests. So that's a major challenge. Looking at the 2018 profile in the TIP report, it outright says, As reported over the last five years, Palau is a destination country for women subjected to sex trafficking and for women and men subjected to forced labor. Uh, women from the Philippines and China are recruited to work in Palau as waitresses or clerks, but some are subsequently forced into prostitution in karaoke bars or massage parlors. Foreign workers on fishing boats in Palauan waters also experience conditions indicative of human trafficking. Official complicity plays a role in facilitating trafficking. Government officials, including labor, immigration, law enforcement, and elected officials have been investigated for complicity. In the 2012 TIP report under the prevention header, it says the Philippines Embassy regularly and formally notified the Palau government by diplomatic note when it added an employer to the blacklist. At least 11 Palauan citizens are currently blacklisted, including a serving senator. Now that serving senator is a reference to the conviction of our current Senate President, Senator Hocons Paules, who we talked about earlier in the episode. The case involved nine alleged trafficking victims using a labor law violation of unlawful wage deductions and penalties that led to an imposed sentence of only 90 days imprisonment. Um, as stated in the report, he has been blacklisted by the Philippines government from employing their citizens. But what brought the government's attention in a very 
public display in 2014 was then Attorney General Victoria Rowe and damn was that drama. Now there's an OTV article from January 31st, 2014 and I'll put that in the blog post. It was titled Community Outraged with Palau's Human Trafficking Here. Members of the community have expressed disappointment and embarrassment at their leaders during the House Committee on Judiciary and Governmental Affairs Oversight Hearing. The hearing grew tense as the delegates questioned and then accused the Attorney General of failing to perform her job. On January 28, 2014, members of the House JGA Committee, including non-committee members, blasted Attorney General Rowe for the United States State Department Trafficking in Persons Report during a two-hour public hearing that was broadcasted live on radio. A.G. Rowe was accused of failing to defend Palau's honor and dignity and was demanded to answer the question of whether she agreed with the report and whether she thought the U.S. report was accurate and true. Speaker Sabino Anastasio, yes, the one and the same, claimed that it is the Attorney General's responsibility to defend Palau and to provide a legal analysis about the veracity of the report, which they then accused her of failing to do. I'm very offended, uh, Vice President and the Attorney General, that this kind of report comes to Palau and there's no analysis done by the Ministry of Justice or the Attorney General to verify whether the, the report is true. It is important to know whether it's true or not. Can you, any, any one of you answer that? Are these uh, all true or, you know, uh, uh, Vice President, uh, our Attorney General is paid to protect Palawans. And we want to hear from her whether the report is true or not. Do you have any analysis on that? Palau is a nation. It's a nation. We, we have our elected leaders. We have elected Congress. And we have the chiefs and the traditional leaders. Can you show some respect, uh, Vice President? Can you tell us whether the report is true or not? Despite A.G. Rowe's response in saying the Minister of Justice did indeed request that she make a presentation on such matters at the said hearing, Delegate Isal continued to badger her about the issue. The hearing continued to intensify when Delegate Isa'al referred to the AG's actions before the Senate hearing as stupid and condemned her, then exclaimed that she should be fired. Where in your contract does it say that you can talk about Tire 1 report without the consultation of your immediate supervisor or the Minister of Justice? Minister of Justice, Vice President Bells, I think the AG failed on behalf of the people of Palau. She, when she spoke, she defended the report. She, she's telling us you ought to do this, ought to do that, ought to do that, without no blessing from you. And so I can blame her. She ought to be fired tomorrow. Could we have one or two Eric Snowden in this house, in this country? The spies, the CIAs the, that are planted in Palau, working for an AZ, yet doing works for state government, reporting the report. Do you know if any AG of AZ in the U.S. has come to any committee of the U.S. Senate or the House, House or the U.S. House of Representatives and speak about that report to in front of any committee in U.S. Congress or the Senate? Do you no, know if any? No, sir, I do not know. Our AZ did. And that was stupid and unfair. The hearing and conduct of the delegates sent a shockwave through Palau and abroad, as citizens lined up on Facebook and web blogs to criticize the House of Delegates for their failure to read the trafficking report for the last four years, and for their failure to focus on the real problem, the victims of human trafficking. That following April, in a statement received by OTV, Roe expressed, It is with great sadness that I will be leaving the Republic of Palau. I have been honored to be appointed Attorney General by President Ramon Sao Jr. to serve this nation. However, I have found that I have a significant difference of opinion with the Minister of Justice, such that I cannot do my job effectively under these circumstances. 
Rowe served as Assistant Attorney General during former President Johnson Toribyong's administration before becoming the Attorney General. During her tenure, she also served as the Acting Director of the Bureau of Public Safety. The effective date of her resignation was April 8, 2014. Now, as to what Palau is currently doing about the human trafficking situation, I'm still not 100% certain. In a July 10, 2018 Island Times report, human trafficking victims will soon have a safe place to stay in Palau with the construction of shelter underway, according to Vice President and Minister of Justice, Reynold Oilo. In an interview, Oilo told reporters that the victims will now have a center that is backed by the government. He added that Palau is serious about combating human trafficking and that it will explore new areas to enhance its capacities so that it can properly identify the victims and the violators. He noted that Palau has an international obligation to eradicate human trafficking. Oilo went on to warn violators that the ministry would apply laws equally to everyone, both Palauans and non-Palauans. He said he instructed his officials to apply the law fairly. We need to get the Palauan employers who violate anti-human trafficking laws of Palau. Another issue was brought up by Mr. Jackson Henry, who asked, The last human trafficker convicted in Palau was a foreigner. How many more of them are ruining Palau's ratings? Excellent question, Mr. Henry. My counter question would be, if a Palauan brings foreign workers in, and one of these foreign workers rapes another foreigner, but in Palau, are they tried in their respective nation of origin or the nation where the crime occurred? I ask this not to be a total smartass, maybe a little smartass, but not total smartass, but it's a genuine question about how you view the occurrence of crime, particularly crimes that violate human rights. Now let me go on and just read a few things from the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000. One, the government of a country should prohibit severe forms of trafficking in persons and punish acts of such trafficking. Two, for the knowing commission of any act of sex trafficking involving force, fraud, coercion, or in which a victim of sex trafficking is a child incapable of giving mean meaningful consent, or of trafficking which includes rape or kidnapping or which causes a death, the government of the country should prescribe punishment commensurate with that for grave crimes such as forcible sexual assault. Three. For the knowing commission of any act of a severe form of trafficking in persons, the government of the country should prescribe punishment that is sufficiently stringent to deter and that adequately reflects the heinous nature of the offense. 4. The government of a country should make serious and sustained efforts to eliminate severe forms of trafficking in persons. Now, these are just some indicators that a country is making those serious and sustained efforts under the minimum standards for the elimination of trafficking in persons per the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. Whether the government of a country protects victims of severe forms of trafficking in persons and encourages their assistance in the investigation and prosecution of such trafficking, including provisions for legal alternatives to their removal to countries in which they would face retribution or hardship, and ensures that victims are not inappropriately incarcerated, fined, or otherwise penalized solely for unlawful acts as a direct result of being trafficked, including by providing training to law enforcement and immigration officials regarding the identification and treatment of trafficking victims using approaches that focus on the needs of the victims. Whether the government of a country extradites persons charged with acts of severe forms of trafficking in persons on substantially the same terms and to substantially the same extent as persons charged with other serious crimes or to the extent such extradition would be inconsistent with the laws of such country or with international agreements to which the country is a party, whether the government is taking all appropriate measures to modify or replace such laws and treaties so as to permit such extradition. But most of all, whether the percentage of victims of severe forms of trafficking in the country that are non-citizens of such countries is insignificant. Just a bit ago, I read a passage from the U.S. State Department's TIP report, but let me read it one more time. Official complicity plays a role in facilitating trafficking. Government officials, including labor, immigration, law enforcement, and elected officials have been investigated for complicity. For anyone with further questions about human trafficking in Palau in general, I will provide links in the blog. That's been this weekend's news overview. 
Thank you for listening to the Shenanigans Podcast. I'm off to do some nanigan-ing until our next regular episode.